Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Welcome to the school committee meeting of December 12th, 2018. As we start all meetings, I have a few announcements. I'd like to remind everyone this meeting is being broadcast live. It is also being recorded for use at a later date if needed, so keep that in mind. I'd ask you to please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Also, would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, thank you all for coming. We have a lot of people here. I see we have the chairs of both towns' boards of selectmen. We have some people here um, from finance committees. We also have our state rep, Josh Cutler, here this evening, and many principals and a bunch of other people from the board of selectmen and both town managers. Thank you all for coming. Tonight's a fairly important night. We're going to roll out a preliminary budget, but I'd entertain uh, that'll be in a few minutes if we get some of this business out of the way. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of November 14, 2018. So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Mara, student advisory report, thank you. All right. So December 4th was the Women Hanson Will community event. Women Hanson Will hosted an evening community meeting to bring together students, parents, and the community as a whole to learn about and address the concerns of substance use affecting our communities. This meeting provided attendees with the opportunity to have a voice in how we address substance use within Whitman Hanson, including solutions based on approaches to tackling issues such as vaping, underage drinking, and the opioid crisis. December 6th was the WH National Honor Society induction ceremony. The 11th was the high school winter concert. The 14th, um, Women Hanson Red Cross Club will be holding a kickoff to the holiday season movie night. They will be showing the movie Elf, and all proceeds will go to the victims of the California wildfires in the Women Hanson Red Cross Club. The movie will start at 6 p.m. in the Porting Arts Center here at the high school. December 21st will be Panther Alumni Day. On Friday, December 21st, WH class of 2018 graduates will be visiting the high school for Panther Alumni Day. They will be giving current WH students advice about life after high school. Last period teachers can sign their class up for this program. The Panther Education Trust, or PET, is a nonprofit 501 community based organization committed to enriching the quality of public education at WH. The next monthly meeting will be held on January 14th. You can follow the Panther Ed Trust Facebook page or at Panther Ed Trust on Twitter for upcoming news and events. The 2018 yearbook is now on sale and could be the perfect gift for that special WH student in your life. Currently $85, the price goes up to $90 on December 15th. Parents, please remember that this, that you can surprise your students in your graduating senior with a recognition ad in the yearbook. You can submit it 24-7 from the comfort of your own home. You can go to whpanthers.wix.com slash yearbook for all your yearbook needs. December 14th will be the real live social night from 6.30 to 9 p.m. at the Whitman Middle School. Activities will include map ball, dodgeball, karaoke, board games, and a dance. Students will be able to sign up for activities during lunches and with the purchase of a ticket. More information can be found on the district website. December 4th was the annual Conley School Polar Express reading by Mrs. Downey. December 14th will be the Duval Grade 1 and Grade 3 con winter concert at 10 a.m. for Grade 1 and 2 p.m. for Grade 3 in the Duval School Cafeteria. December 15th will also, also be the Grade 1 and Grade 3 holiday concert for Indian Head at 2 p.m. in the gymnasium. Holiday recess this year will be from December 24th to January 1st, and we will return to school on January 2nd. Any questions for Mara? Thank you. Thank Excellent you. job. Okay, before we get into the superintendent's report, I'm going to give you a few dates to remember. December 18th is a middle school concert. It's here in the Performing Arts Center at 7 p.m. December 24th, 2018 through January 1st, 2019 is the holiday recess. School will be closed. All departments will be closed. January 27th is the polar plunge benefiting the Indian Head School in Hanson. That's at Camp Kiwani. 
I believe uh, all Hanson members are signed up. I believe Mr. Simonek is signed up. We're going to twist Mr. Farrow and Dr. Jones's arm to get signed up. Sure. <laughs> did I hear a yes from Dr. Jones? You did hear a yes. I had a text as I walked home. Good answer. Does that leave Mr. Farrow as the only? Look. <laughs> 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 Jeff said I was doing it about a month ago, so I said, <laughs> so I said sure. That's how we left it. <laughs> Can't wait. Also, also, it was suggested at the last meeting when we had a, a, a member that was, uh, was absent who used to volunteer a lot with his mother in the Indian Head School that it would only be fitting for him being the only Whitman guy to uh, be doing the pull of plunge. I believe Mr. Small made the motion, and I think the rest of the committee agreed <laughs> that it would be Mr. Mr. Boyce. Yeah, thanks. So there is a penalty for missing a meeting. It is, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> we volunteered you to represent Whitman. <laughs> okay, good. Perfect. So keep in mind the 27th is the pull of plunge. And also that same day at 12 o'clock here at the high school is the pizza bowl. So you can go for a swim at Kiwani, <laughs> then come up and have a pizza. Sounds like a plan. And we have a school committee January, school committee meeting January. Yep. The change was gonna uh, be. Yeah, the 16th. January 16th Sorry. is our next school committee meeting. So, any questions, anyone? Okay, superintendent's report. Uh, tonight, before we get into that, just briefly, as you can see, there's a budget discussion. We thought it prudent to get into the budget and discuss where we are with the budget. As you know, our budget is a lot dependent on what happens with the governor's budget. So these numbers are preliminary off of history that we've taken over the last few years. The superintendent, the assistant superintendent, the business manager have looked back at a snapshot of history <clears throat> of what the numbers sort of look like. So this is not a steadfast budget. This is a rollout in December because we, we know both towns have been having meetings with finance committees and boards of selectmen, and we'd like to let them know somewhat where our numbers would be so we can work together as a whole and come up with some sort of a budget to the town's people that is gonna work for everybody. So keep in mind, I, I'm reiterating, these numbers are preliminary because our budget is contingent on what happens with the governor's budget, which that comes out and gets bounced around sometimes into May. So. We're going to do the very best. As he's given you the report, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll stop. If there's questions that we can't answer this evening, we will write your questions on and get back to you at the next meeting. Our hope is to have this budget discussion at every school committee meeting until the May town meeting minimal. So in January, we will be inviting everyone back. We will put the budget discussion at the very front of the meeting so everybody can come in and get out you don't have to stay for the whole meeting if you don't want to and it'll be updated any new figures from the towns from the schools from the finance committees it'll give everybody in both towns the opportunity to see what the budgets of the departments are where we're going how we're going to get there and how we possibly can make it all work so if you have any questions along the way raise your hand i'll stop them and we'll go from there. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Superintendent. Um, so first of all, I, for the committee, I, I just want to uh, apologize and take ownership if I've misled anybody in the process of this budget. Traditionally, we've given our budget in February. We started internal talks in October, November, but nothing formal has come out. Um, this past fall, the Whitman uh, a few folks in Whitman, uh, Mr. Lambiasi invited <coughs> myself and Christine, uh, Mr. Small and Mr. Trotter went to a couple, of, a couple of meetings to discuss capital and budget. We were there and at our last meeting we presented our capital plan for the next five years. I also have a meeting scheduled next week that was scheduled back in October. Um, the chair of the FinCom in Whitman asked us to present some numbers and we chose December 18th. So that's the date that we were supposed to present our numbers to the Whitman FinCom. I know through social media, some folks have said our budget has come up at different FinCom and different selectmen's meetings. And I know school committee members are taking the brunt for, for that. So if 
I've misled committee members or any way. That's the process that I'm trying to follow. It's a little different than in the past, mm -hmm. and we're going to follow what we have in place right now. I also would have been remiss to not present you with numbers before I presented them to FinCom in either town because you are the governing body of the school district and you actually evaluate me and you're my boss. So I'd like to share with you the numbers before we go out and about to the town, um, to both towns. So what you have in your packet, and I also want to preface this, this is a discussion. This is in our formal presentation to, to the communities. We will have a budget book very similar to this in February. We haven't had, uh, had adequate time to really put something together in the past couple of months. This is a, a, a December, January, February budget book together to put together. But we have rough numbers, um, which I'm going to share with you and hopefully keep it simple because the way George and I operate as simple. building leaders, we try to keep it simple through our, our students, our faculty, and now our community so that people know what we do and why we do things. So in your packet, on the first page, you'll see that we have a proposed draft for FY20. What I've done, what we've done, is broken it down by school for site-based expenses, electric, gas, custodial, transportation, phone service, and trash. We've also put in that front page our enrollments per school, what we spend out in tuitions, technology, facilities, our debt, our others, which are all our health care insurances, Medicare and unemployment insurances, special education costs and administrative costs, as well as transportation. So what I'm going to do for you is break that down and break that down for the folks in the, in the gallery so that, again, keeping it simple so you know where our dollars go. And um, if you just bear with me as we go through it, um, I'll give you some numbers. And if people have questions, feel free. And as Mr. Hayes said, I'm not prepared to answer a ton of questions around specifics. I haven't briefed myself in every bit of legislature, everything that DESE has provided yet. We'll have those, and if you want to have those questions answered, we'll be at the next school committee meeting, or feel free to email or call me and I'll answer those questions for you. So, as we go through this, in site-based expenses, and this is on your second sheet, site-based expenses include supplies, instructional materials, teacher salaries, para salaries, photocopier costs, substitute coverages, special education teachers, clinic supplies, uh, curricular salaries, library staff and supplies, special education specialists, which are psychologists, speech and language folks, DCBAs, and our audit district coordinator, building insurances, English as a second language teachers, support professional uh, uh, support folks, professional development and course reimbursement, graduation where it's fit it doesn't necessarily in the elementaries but in the high school it's part of graduation online learning athletics equipment maintenance and administrative travel so if you see under site-based expenses for our pre-k this year we're proposing that it's going to cost four hundred and forty three thousand dollars three hundred forty nine dollars to run our pre-k in they don't have any electric gas because that's one of our programs that we move to the high school under Indian Head, with a total enrollment of 515 students, our site-based expenses are 3793, 398, and these are all projections. Our electric costs projected at 81,425. Our gas costs at 58,756. Our custodial costs, and this is a year, 136,555. Our transportation costs, 206,201. 13333 for phone, trash, which is picked up three times a week at 9429, for a total cost of Indian Head at 4299097. Conley School with an enrollment of 528 students, and these are our, our numbers from October of 18. Site based expenses 3167, 398. Electric 67598. Gas at 42787. Uh, 42, Custodial at 141131. Transportation is the same as Indian Head, 206201. 13333 for phone, 9429 for trash, with total expenditure at Conley at 3647877.
Jeff, before you yes. move forward, can I interrupt you a minute? Absolutely. The reason the phone system and the trash are the same for all schools <coughs> is the phone system is district-wide. It's a district-wide phone system. It's connected to all the buildings. Mm -hmm. So obviously we just divided by that. In the same way with the trash bill. The trash bill comes in. Right. Each school has dumpsters, different needs. Like we may have more trash here at the high school than we do at the Indian Ed or we do it uh, far, uh, calmly uh, Duval, but they just split it evenly. So some of those costs are the same. It's because it was split like that. Yeah. No. Okay, I'm sorry. No problem. Duval School, total enrollment of 443 this year. Site base 34.35739. Electric is 68.392. Gas is 33.483. Custodial is 137.760. Transportation is 237.924. Phone, as Mr. Hayes said, is 13333, and trash is the same at 9429. Total expenditures for Duval projected 3936061. Whitman Middle School, enrollment of 580. Site base 3852986. Electric at 87493. Gas is 46450. Uh, <coughs> Custodial is 214771. Transportation is 222062. Phone is the same. Trash is the same. Total cost 4446525. Hanson Middle School, 479 enrollment, 4012612 for site based expenses. Electric is 116088. Gas is 58433. Custodial is 206. 825, transportation is 190, 339, phone and trash are the same. Total cost to operate Hanson Middle School is 4607059. The high school with a total enrollment of 1278, site based expenses 7455410, electric at 429003, gas is 98. 093 custodial is 351 842 transportation is 523 433 phone is the same at 13333 trash is a five day cycle 27 855 total for high school 8898969 the next column our tuitions to others to others our school choice and our charter is 781-815. In technology, you we have under site based or expenses, salaries, contracted services, equipment and maintenance, supplies, equipment replacement, and travel. The total budget projected for technology services in our district is 1371365. Facilities include salaries. Snow removal, contracted services, supplies, building maintenance, equipment maintenance, maintenance, contracted services, emergency repairs, fuel, oil, and gas, police details, and overtime. Projected budget for facilities is 1498591. Our debt that we carry is 890983. Our other, which are our health care benefits, Medicare insurance and unemployment insurance, is 8171802. <coughs> special education. Special education costs are tutoring services, administrative support salaries, supplies, summer materials, because we run special education year round, travel, contracted services, including outside evaluations, PT, OT, et cetera, multiple things that special education students need, legal fees, out of district placements, and I'll get to that in a little bit, out of district transportation, and summer salaries. Special education costs projected for FY or for 2020 are 6177353. Administrative costs are central office salaries. Jeff, one yes, second, I'm sorry. Please. Mr. Small. I had a question on the SPED expenses because I thought our SPED expenses were quite were much higher than that, uh, even that, looking at DESE reports. 
our, our these are our sped costs from central office, not site based. Okay. So, 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 in. so what we did was this is only one teachers. small part. Correct. This is special education, which are the chunk of this of this money is our out of district transportation and placements. Okay. And I'll hit that up in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Sir. This doesn't include special education teachers in schools. Central office are salaries, school committee expenses, supplies, legal, all of our principal salaries, our curriculum director salaries, photocopying costs, contracted services, instructional materials. And I, I highlighted curriculum programs, such as our No Adam program and our math program that we're looking at, and supplies, consumables. Our total admin cost projected for FY20, 4,013,043. And the last category is transportation slash other. That is transportation salaries. We have a bus that we have to contract in reserve in case we need additional routes throughout the course of the year. And then homeless transportation. That number is 274041. And as I present to you in the, in, in the gallery, these are rough numbers. And in our budget book, it will be itemized more specifically. But I wanted the folks in, in the gallery and on TV and here, especially the committee, to understand where we are. <clears throat> so the total budget, if you add all of that up, for FY20 is 53,457,929, nine, which is a difference from 50,523,181 last year, and the difference is 2,934,748. That doesn't include any revenues. That are our, those are our expected costs based upon history over the last few years. So as I get into a little of the explanation of this and why some of those things moved up, because folks will say, well, why is it up? Well, in the areas of focus, as you can see, we have six schools and a preschool. I have 664 employees that are on our payroll. That's how many folks we pay out in the course of the year. That includes daily substitute teachers. We have a total enrollment of 3823, ages 3 to 22. Our smallest kids start, our youngest kids start in preschool at 3, and some students by law were required to educate until 22. I threw in for you right now a recent update of our, our, pupil, our per pupil expenditure given to me last Thursday by DESE. Our state and local contributions are 11, 7, 67, 46 in state that's our per pupil expenditure as of what I got last Thursday from Desi we, including the fed cuz they give us 400 bucks is 1217579 the average massachusetts school expenditure is 154962 and you can just do the math we're a little lower than that i gave you the numbers on last year's budget and our budget project, projections our special education costs have gone up $750,000 since last year. We're projected to do five, over $5 million in out-of-district placements and out-of-district transportation. Our contracted services, which you'll vote on next month, SJ, our um, <coughs> transportation and our smart center contract are up 2%, 2.5% that Christine presented. And our WHEA contracts, those are our, our association contracts, and the only one that hasn't been ratified yet is Unit B. For 1819, our Unit A contract was 2%. 1920 and 2021 were 1.1 each 90 days. And that was a split that was negotiated. And our insurance increases go up every year, 4%, 5%. So that, those are the numbers that we have for a level service budget we are not adding any program but what george and i have done this year is tried to be as efficient as possible in restructuring things that we currently have and renegotiating and we have a, a unit b contract that it, we have a tentative agreement which might make some funds available for us to add some program out of the current level service budget we're not adding people we're restructuring positions to potentially add services that are needed in the elementary school. So what I just told you <coughs> folks is a level service budget. This doesn't add teachers. This doesn't add program. I've gone around to each building and asked teachers what we need, 
what they want and what we should have. They feel like we educate all kids, but they do feel like sometimes some of our most, our brightest students don't have opportunities in school or out of school to perform. And those things have been cut out of the budget. The notice increase in out of district placements this year, I think we, we've talked about and we've cut all of our special education programs that we used to tuition in, and George has more history on that, we've cut those programs out. And all those social emotional students and those special education students we're sending out. In your packet, our special education folks gave you a definition of circuit breaker and what it is. And circuit breaker is very confusing because people think we just get every bit of dollars back that we send out to our out of district tuitions that we get it back. That's not so. And down, down below, if you just read that through, and I don't want to read it to, to everyone, this will be available to folks in our, in our budget, or if you request it, we can send it to you. But we get a percentage back after foundation is met of our special education cost. And as you can see, tuitions are paid to 17 different placements, ranging in costs from 39,735 to 319,280. We have students in this district that were, were by law er, held responsible to educate, and it's the right thing to do in residential placements. Some of those cost an exorbitant amount of money. We will get some money back from that, but we don't get it all back. And those students at 3973, that's all our cost. We get zero money back in Circuit Breaker from transportation. So we own all of our out-of-district transportation. And my rough estimate, and I don't have that in front of me, is about $180,000, okay? Uh, excuse me, pre pre predicted, it's right there for you. Right. Right. It's seven, seven, uh, seven hundred and seventeen thousand dollars nine fifty-five. That's our transportation cost that we ship out. Just okay. to be clear, for every child that is, we do not educate in this district. For every single child we don't educate in this district, we are fully on the hook for one hundred percent of their transportation costs, and that is not reimbursable. Mm. Right. And just to clarify, and I'm ninety-nine percent. I know the answer. That is mandated. We cannot cut that, we cannot change that, we are required to pay that no matter what. Correct. Correct. So the process when students go out, so some folks might say, well, if you just don't feel like educating this child, you send them somewhere. That's not necessarily the case. Most parents want their child educated home, here. Sometimes we don't have the program. And I presented last month at school committee, we're looking at building program back so that we can incur some of this and tuition students in. Back in the day when George was principal, we had tuition in costs. We don't tuition in anymore. We've cut all those programs. So as teachers have retired from those programs, off they went. And this is where we're seeing the increases in our out of district because I firmly believe we have people that we could educate here if we had a little bit more money and the people in place. And in fact, then defer the cost of our out of districts with some tuitions in. So the historical perspective, in 2013, we, we sent out 37, 2014, 34, 2015, 42, 2016, 35, 2017, 33, 2018, 37, and projected next year is 48. That's why the increase in cost, okay? Um, and on the back of that, uh, special education put together the cost for in-district students can include above and beyond expenditures from staff for transportation, OT, PT, home-based services, assistive technology, students with devices because of different issues that they have, independent evals, and then hospital or home tutoring. We do have students that are in the hospital that deserve to be educated. We pay for that as well. So that's all wrapped into the education budget in special education. Administrative costs. Folks might say, under your admin, your costs are exorbitant, outrageous. Well, our salaries are in that, and I'll be as, as transparent as I need to be. My salary this year was 164,532. It'll increase to 168,645. People in town say that you know, you're not transparent with your money. George and I are extremely honest and open. Whatever you need to know, we will tell folks. Just have to ask the question and approach it, and we will always share that with you first. But our salaries are within line, as well as our teacher salaries, within line with everywhere else in the Commonwealth, excluding the far west where the cost of living might be very different. 
The superintendent might make 140 out in, at Frontier Regional Voc Tech in, in, I don't even know what community that's in. But their cost of living, they can buy a house for $110,000. So it's a little different. We are very in the middle, as George presented with our education, in the middle last month. We are very in the middle with our salaries. We want good folks. I think we get Cadillac for Chevy. I said this before. But we won't be able to maintain that if we're not successful in a level service budget next year. And I would hate to go back and do some damage to the good things and the positive things we've done. That doesn't mean these numbers might be flexed over the next two to three months, as Mr. Hayes said. Once we get revenues, we have no idea where the governor's budget is. I'm still waiting to hear about the surplus budget that the governor said back in November around the election. Haven't seen a nickel. Mr. Cutler's in the audience. I know he might, that might be something for him to answer. But those are things that we, we depend on as a regional school district. We get a little under 50% from the state of Massachusetts for education. I looked at, num at the numbers. We're much higher than most communities in the, in the area. That last page that you have, the long page, is our per pupil expenditure, and I, I went over those numbers a little bit with you. But it's highlighted in yellow to see where we are and our per pupil costs broken up in the district. Of note on this, on this last page that you all have, this came to us from the DESC. This is a new initiative from the DESC. We've always had a school and district report card. This year, the school and district report card includes monies that are spent, monies that are spent by the town, monies that are spent by the state, and then monies that are spent by federal, federal funds tracked down to individual students and the per pupil for them, um, and then the percentages of it. So that has just come out. It is actually, um, we're presenting it to the public right now, but it is still um, in what's called the DSE portal, but we felt it was important that you all could look at that because that's the latest numbers they had. Because this is brand new, the state is then going to re, is going to release the FY18 expenditure, this very same thing, this year. So for the first time, the state is having a new school and district report card, including finances, just released in December for 17, will now re-release in the spring for 18 so that they can get on a one-year patent for it. And it is uh, a pretty valuable tool once we, we become more familiar with it and once we can share it with everyone. Thanks, George. Any questions from anybody? So far, you, you've turned a ton of information. Yeah. Well, Fred? And I think the one big key that's missing, obviously, is to fine-tune what the revenue side is mm -hmm. going to look like. And that's what we're going to look for in February. Yeah, I know that, you know, we did share, you know, for instance, our PK costs. Yep. Uh, that's run through a revolving fund that doesn't necessarily come out of the operating fund. Parents pay for their ch children to go to the pre-K. Correct. Mm -hmm. So Some. Uh, it is a split. So there's tuition-based and there's our pre-K is an inclusionary pre-K. So if a student, it's a special education program, they, they start their school at, at three years old. Mm -hmm. And that's the other piece. This is the, the challenging piece. This is in our formal presentation. So if there are questions, I will, I'm very happy to take some. Some I won't have answers to. And I'll throw that out there to folks in the gallery too. If, if you want to come up and have a conversation, have coffee upstairs with the superintendent and the assistant superintendent, I'll answer questions. I'm not going to get into privacy issues around certain students or things that are private, but anything that we have here is open for folks. If folks are uncomfortable coming to the school upstairs, I'll meet them for coffee at Mary Lou's or Dunks. It's okay. I'm very open to having those conversations, but I want to keep the conversation civil, and I'd rather have the conversations with myself, George, and Christine rather than Facebook. Okay, because I will not answer questions on Facebook. I don't. I can't win. So, Mr. Boyce, Jeff, I think since day one, you and George have been exactly in the right direction that we want to go. You talked about this with the new interim um, special ed education director. Um, you know, I know I read the minutes for North Co North River Collaborative being there, and I know you've been very involved. You know what those tuition fees are. We had to go up with ours at uh, Pilgrim area. Yeah, we would love to do more. I mean, obviously, it's a case by case and whatever, whatever comes out of that from the uh, special ed director. Um, also, go, um, just thinking of the, well, let me pass on that. But 
we'll get to it. But I'm just thinking on the target share. I mean, I don't know. I'm already jumping into something that would be like a, a January or February number, but um, we've been aggressive over the last couple of years mm -hmm. to get to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if that's even maybe right after the governor's budget be available or whatever. We'll roll, we'll roll all that yeah, out. Yeah, that's, that's a perfect example Again, of systematic so that folks what we can worked see hard on at. to hope, hope to see that increase. The, the one thing I wanted to share with the committee as well, and I, I know we have folks in, in, in the gallery that, that represent the towns and the chiefs and, and the police chiefs and the fire feet, they, they represent their folks in the community, and I think it's great. I represent the kids, the, the, the 3,853 kids here and the 600 plus employees or 500 plus employees here. I want to do the best for those. As you asked me in this, in this room, in my interview, what will you do for our community? I'm going to advocate for them as always. I'm never going to say we should go back. I'm going to say we should move forward. I said at the opening faculty meeting, I don't like to be marginal. We are marginal. I'll play within the rules, but I'll always advocate for the folks that I'm responsible for. And I've also had the honor to walk and graduate kids and see the smile at the completion. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. And more is going to do that this year. You know, this is the product that we start at age three and graduate sometimes at 22, most of the time at 18. So this is why it's important to make sure we maintain what we have and not regress to go below marginal or in the middle. Mr. Toronto. Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment that um, I think the budget proposal you made this evening was very well thought out. I think it was very um, succinct in the sense of it's pretty much right in front of you as to how the budget is built, what's incorporated into it. And I think that will let the public know um, exactly what we need and what our expenses are. And um, just by following this, that's probably one of the clearest I've seen in a long time. So I'd like to compliment you on that. I would agree. Also, another question that was asked and that I'm just going to answer before someone asks it. If anyone is in, wants to know, it, it seems to be that, and Jeff touched on it, Facebook talks about salaries and hiding and not transparent. If you look in the town report, it tells you the salary by name of every single teacher paid by the Whitman Hanson Regional School District. There's nothing hidden. It's printed by the town. You open it up, it's alphabetically driven, and you can look and see what every single teacher, including George and, and Jeff and administrators and secretaries, every <clears throat> single person is paid. There is nothing hidden in this budget. It is all in there, and, and inclusively, as you'll see, that book that's in front of George, yeah. I mean, Jeff, is <laughs> very, is, is a ton of pages. It may be a little bit more complicated, but we sat and tried to figure out how it was going to be so everybody would get a better snapshot. It's kind of like people talk about their electric bill, and it's $112.50, and it went up 12%, and, and so it went up $15. Our electric bill, as you can see here at the high school, is uh, 400 and something thousand dollars. 429. $429,000.03. $429, so when the electric bill goes up at your house by 10%, it goes up 10 to $15, or $30. When it goes up here by 10%, it goes up $42,000. It's not a small amount. So if you look at all the electrical bills, you're talking right around $800,000 or somewhere in that vicinity. So when it goes up by 10%, it goes up by 80,000 in the school district. And I'm not, it's, it's not a small number. I'm just telling you that, you know, when, when you mow your lawn, you might mow a quarter of an acre. When we mow the lawn in six buildings, we mow over 1 million square feet. We don't use a $99 lawnmower. We use a $70,000 lawnmower. And we have a bunch of employees. So I'm just trying to get across the fact that this is a large operation that both towns here are paying to run, and it gets expensive when things go up. And when they go up, just that as an example. So that's why they broke it down better, so it would be easier to understand what schools cost, what each school costs. And that didn't include those figures. At the end, it included <clears throat> the administrative costs, but it was tough to break down what every school needs for administration or special education. So that's why the numbers came out the way they did. But it's all right there. And that's, they, I think they did as well as they could possibly do 
preliminarily trying to come up with a budget that everybody could see. So if there's any questions, now is the time to ask them. And if we don't have the answers, Jeff and George, like they said, they'll meet you here, they'll call you, they'll get back to you. They can go to Mary Lou's, Duncan, whatever. Whatever. It, get me out of the office. Be. <laughs> Chris, and then Fred. So um, I think this is helpful. So for our future discussions, are you thinking you'd actually be able to show current budget versus this budget so we could actually line up the increases? Sure. Yeah. And then specifically, I would be really interested in a couple very specific points. What do we see the insurance increase, which I think you'd have on here yep. right. year over year? And then could you quantify all the unfunded mandates? Sure. Mm -hmm. Like a summary of here, are, here's the grand total of all the unfunded, unfunded mandates that we have. And we can give you the, the, the percentages of what we got, we've gotten in the past in, in homeless, the, yes. in, in, as that fluctuates, we'll do all of that stuff for you for January. Fantastic. Absolutely. This is small. Uh, in underfunded as well. Underfunded, yeah. Anything um, that, that we're supposed to get money back and anything yeah. that we don't get back. Correct. And uh, speaking to that, and I'm probably jumping ahead a few steps, uh, looking at where we can increase revenues and there's a couple of definitive areas at least in my mind uh, if we look at our chapter 70 funding it's flat we're put into the hold harmless category and if we look at the uh, foundation review committee uh, that just concluded uh, four separate scenarios of how they would like to see the foundation budget recalculated uh, under any of the four scenarios, we do not see an increase in our Chapter 70 funding. Mm -hmm. And that's very common to regions. Mm -hmm. uh, regions are penalized in that regard. What I would like to see our state do somehow is tie in our Chapter 70 funding to a percentage. Instead of giving us a $25, $50, $55 increase per pupil, if they gave us a two, two and a half percent increase on our Chapter 70 funding, because our towns can't sustain when they're only giving us 0.54 percent of an increase, the towns, they don't have the capacity. And if they could do that, I think we could solve a very large problem. Uh, regional transportation, uh, we were lucky we picked up uh, I think it went up to 72% this year reimbursement as opposed to 65 that we had seen in years past. Uh, if we could make strides on that, make strides on increased uh, reimbursement for Circuit Breaker and McKinney Vento Homeless Transportation, uh, those would be the areas that I would hope that our state reps could and state senator could uh, advocate and be able to increase for us. Just, just on that, just again, we're talking about costs. The average cost per day, or the cost per day currently right now, is to to run our buses for the day, is eighty-eight eleven sixty-four, eight thousand eight hundred eleven dollars sixty-four cents to run our buses every day. That's Which, by statute, says that they will fully reimburse us. Mm -hmm. uh, but just but giving yeah. you that perspective, when Mr. Hayes was talking about lawns, it's not just the bus going back and forth. It's eight thousand dollars per day. Or eighty-eight hundred dollars per day to run our buses. <clears throat> Does anyone have any budgetary type questions before we move on? Anyone from the committee, gallery? No. Do you have anything else? Uh, not as far as budget. No, nope. I'm good. We'll, we'll we'll take questions. Email George or myself anytime. If you want a phone call, that's fine. If you want an appointment, great. If you want to meet for coffee, great. We take budget questions and, and just talk about the Patriots' loss in Miami. So. Uh, Fred? How much information can we be able to put online so that people can access it, you know, at their leisure, so to speak? I, I think we can look at what I presented to you. I wanted you to have in the in the packet. I am meeting with Whitman Fincom next week, so I'm going to present this material. It's an open meeting. We just talked about all these numbers, so I'm comfortable with that. You know, um, we'll put it up on our website. And one of the things that George and I are, are really trying to do this year is, is really be as efficient with our programs. And in that technology, we talked about our tech budget. We have to pay for our accounting system, which is Munis. We pay for Infinite Campus, help parents get the portal. We pay for our website. We pay for our messaging system. 
We pay for um, our nursing system. We pay for ESPED, our special education system. Those are all costs that are associated that we have contracts for. What we're trying to do is pare that down to be as, as efficient as possible. What we have found in the past is that we have some programs that we, we don't utilize to the fullest. Our business office has gone through 10 days of munis training because we're only using this much of munis. Well, we want to use this much. Our, our website, it, our contract is over. We're working with another vendor to make sure that we can effectively communicate with parents through our messaging system and maybe tie in our website and put an app out there. So when, when we do something in school, it will come to your phone via text message, via app, via all these things so that we can effectively communicate with parents and reduce costs. And that's where we haven't gotten to yet. It's been four months so, since we've been on the job, well, almost six, but really diving down into all of our processes to make sure that our taxpayers are heard and they're getting the most bang for their buck that we can and that folks are saying, well, you're not, you're really utilizing that. I don't want us to ever say that we don't utilize everything we pay for to the extent of that ability. So we're still in that process. We should have some more numbers for you in, in February. Jeff, did you say that you have a meeting with um, FinCom? Next Tuesday at 7 in Whitman. I would ask if a FinCom members that are here on the chairs, would they please notify the school committee and uh, Secretary Michelle? So we could post a meeting if any of the members would like to be at finance committee meetings we have to uh, post so would you send them a, a memo michelle and see if we can make that and the same with i i see frank's here this evening do you have anything to add or subtract frank josh sure Thank you for coming. It's nice to have our state rep here, Josh Cutler. You should have, uh, I'll go to this way. You should have um, Cox for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Good evening. Thanks for uh, inviting me to join you again for our discussion. I bring uh, good tidings from Senator Brady and Representative Deal. They're unable to come tonight, so. Uh, be kind to me. I have no backup. <laughs> <laughs> That's, good. That's why I'm wearing the beard. Though. <laughs> so there's no check, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, on a serious note, I did want to, he's not here, unfortunately, but I did want to, to extend my thanks and recognition to Representative Deal, who's obviously um, leaving the legislature, and it's been a, a pleasure to work with him. Even though we're not from the same party, we've, we've always worked together these past six years. Uh, he was very kind when I was a new legislator, taking... <laughs> out to lunch to kind of um, show me the ropes. And so I appreciate that and wish him well in his new endeavors, whatever those may be. So I just wanted to, uh, to say that. Um, I wanted to go over this memo quickly and I'm, I took uh, some furious notes. Um, so I'll, I'll try to hit as many of those topics as you guys raised um, feel free to uh, ask questions at the end. Um, wanted to just uh, on a lighter note acknowledge um, our great intern that we have working for us uh, up at the State House and also down here in the district, who just happens to be sitting to my right, <laughs> Mara Burt, <laughs> Senior Whip and Hanson. Obviously, you know her talents already, but she's been a, a great part of uh, helping our office as well. So I wanted you guys to all be, be aware of that. Whip and Hanson is represented up at the State House all the time. So, um, so before you, you have um, a brief memo from our uh, team, from myself and Senator Brady and Representative Deal, just kind of a, a, a sort of a rundown of the budget process. I know for most of you this is uh, old hat, um, but I wanted to give you an update pr primarily on the sort of the first step in the process, which has already happened, uh, which is having the consensus revenue hearing. Um, that was a, uh, that's an annual part, sort of the first inning, if you will, of our nine inning budget process, and that was the first inning, and that was just held last week. So again, we are early in our budget process as you are. Um, in fact, you're further along than the state is, so kudos to you for that. Um, so we had the Ways and Means Consensus Revenue Hearing. Uh, I was in attendance last week on Wednesday, and I just want to run down some of the key findings because I think they kind of inform our discussion locally, but also on a, on a more macro level. Um, first off, um, the, the previous, well, going back a couple fiscal years to FY16 and 17, we saw fairly poor revenue growth. If you recall, we actually had uh, revenue coming in below projections for a couple years in a row, which is, um, makes life more challenging. 
Uh, FY18 was a much different story. Revenue growth uh, was much, much stronger. And the economists attributed this to uh, a variety of factors. The three that they cited were uh, what's listed here, which is um, much stronger stock market uh, performance compared to the previous two years after some slow growth. Um, changes in federal tax law, especially as it relates to corporate tax law and so-called SALT, the state and local income tax deductions, which uh, I think prompted folks to accelerate tax payments to get in before the end of the calendar year, last year, if you recall. And then uh, continued strong economy here in Massachusetts and, and, and rising employment rate. So those are the three sort of main factors that they attribute to FY18 being much stronger. And they did kind of caution us that the first two factors, at least, were more what, I, what they call episodic events and weren't necessarily indicative of a trend uh, in terms of a long-term sustainable trend. Um, so we're in FY19. FY19 is off to a, a positive start as well. Uh, revenues are up 4.1% over benchmarks for the current fiscal year, which is good. Um, they do see some potential for upside, which is the term that they use, meaning you know a surplus. I hate to use that word, but um, an upside in revenues for the fiscal year. But then again, just caution that we're very early on. We're just in you know, getting the November numbers for the fiscal year that started July 1st. So <coughs> um, we're still early on. The January, February months are very big for state revenues, uh, as are the later spring months, as you might imagine. So we'll know a lot more um, by early spring in terms of where we're at for this year's revenues. Um, just generally speaking, uh, the economic picture, if I had, you know, was a meteorologist, I would classify it as uh, you know, mostly sunny with the, with the chance of showers. That might be the way I would uh, <laughs> sort of forecast. Um, projecting strong growth through at least the first half of, of the calendar year, 2019. Uh, unemployment rate actually expected to, to drop even further, down in the range of 3.3 uh, to 3.5. And then in FY20, even uh, a tick below that. Um, so for FY20, so for in the next fiscal year, which is what we're planning for now, they're projecting revenues to be in the ballpark of, um, excuse me, the range of 29.2 to 29.38 billion, uh, or an increase of 2.9% up to 3.5%. Um, this uh, forecast includes what's expected to be um, a reduction in the state income tax, so good news for everybody who pays income tax, um, which will be dropping it from 5.1% to 5.05% in January of this, of, of 2019. And that it's expected that that will drop again from 505 to 50 uh, in January of 2020. And that is because of triggers that are built in uh, because of the economy. So I uh, can't take credit for that, but um, uh, that is expected to happen. Um, so they were careful not to talk about the word recession. <laughs> No one wants to talk about that word. Um, they did stress that you know this kind of growth can't continue. It's not sustainable. Uh, and while they're not projecting any kind of recession in 2020, uh, they do expect some slowdown in growth. Okay, so um, just want to kind of put that out there. And that's for a variety of factors. Uh, you know, some of the global factors, global economic economic factors, trade tariffs, a cooling housing market, which um, they expect with a federal rate hike, and then uh, you know political instability can contribute to that as well. Um, so uh, one other just note in terms of, and this gets to one of the questions that uh, Fred had, or someone had asked about, our state stabilization fund, uh, which is sort of our rainy day fund, if you will, um, we had at one point um, over $2 billion back um, before the Great Recession. And uh, after that, um, and obviously several years of, of anemic growth, uh, we dipped into that uh, rainy day fund, and it had dipped well below $2 billion. And uh, as a result of that, we saw actually the state's credit rating downrated by one of the major rating agencies. And I know for most folks, you know, it's like, why does that even matter to us? Well, it, it matters because it affects our borrowing rates, and so it affects what we pay, and so it affects everything else. Um, so it's, it's pretty important. So one of the things that we've tried to do is to be you know, fiscally disciplined to deposit more funds back into that rainy day fund. And so we did put a big chunk of the surplus, and I put that in air quotes because it's not really a surplus, but um, we did put a big chunk of that back into our rainy day fund, over $700 million during the last fiscal year, to get that back up over $2 billion, um, which we hope when it's come time to um, 
do another credit analysis will help, uh, help our, our case. Um, even at the $2 billion revenue mark, though, um, our state treasurer recommends that we actually should be trying to target $4 billion, so um, still some, some growth there. So that's sort of the report that we got. Um, the next step in the process is that they'll actually come up with a, a single consensus revenue figure, and that will usually be released in early January, and that is the key number upon which the entire state budget is basically built. The governor will um, base his budget on that figure, and as the year goes on, and if, you know, if we get any uh, new information, we'll make adjustments, but that's the basic baseline, the foundation, if you will, the house that we build, um, that we build our house on is that uh, foundation, excuse me, that consensus revenue figure. Um, I don't have the figure now, I wouldn't want to speculate, but you can kind of, I think, guess based on some of the information I've given where in the range it's going to be. Um, after that, of course, and again, this is maybe more folks who are in the audience or watching at home, since I know you guys know the process pretty well, um, the governor will file his budget end of January, early February, uh, except in rare cases. Um, that offers a very good baseline figure for your own budgeting purposes in terms of finding out what um, Chapter 70, UGA, Unrestricted General Government Aid, and some of the other line item accounts will be. Um, only once in my now six years has the numbers, the final number ever been below that, and that was the very first year when we were still uh, having uh, more economic uh, concerns. So that's a good baseline, and usually the number only goes up. Um, Ways and Means budget hearings run through March. It's an opportunity for us to kind of go around the state and hear from different folks uh, in the different areas of the budget. Uh, and then, as you know, the, the Ways and Means budget comes out in April, and that's an opportunity for us to make amendments, try to advocate for different line items, and that's when I, I know my phone will be start ringing uh, off the hook, and uh, then eventually um, the Senate takes up the bill, takes up the budget, we have a conference committee that irons out the differences, and then uh, hopefully we have a final budget uh, to the governor by the end of June, and then we take care of any kind of uh, overrides or final uh, vetoes and have it done by July 1st or, or very close thereafter. Um, so you have all that information here. Uh, my uh, contact information is here, <coughs> along with Senator Brady and phone number. Just want to note that probably next term our, 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 our phone numbers may change, so if you need to get a hold of us, um, let me know. Um, happy to talk further about that. I, if I, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just wanted to address some of the uh, topics that were already raised. Um, thank you so much for um, all the great questions and, and issues. Um, so in the, in the current fiscal year, FY19 that we're in now, um, you know, of course, no budget is, is perfect, but, you know, I, I felt pretty good about what we were able to do in a, in a lot of local aid accounts in the current fiscal year. It's obviously never as much as we would like, but if you look at some of the numbers, and I'd just like to run through them quickly, um, we saw, for instance, we saw in um, uh, unrestricted general government aid an increase of 3.8 percent over the prior fiscal year. We saw with Chapter 70, and I'll come back to some of the formula kind of questions that I know folks have, we saw an overall increase of 3.4%. Uh, for charter school reimbursement, we saw an increase of 8.4% uh, over the prior fiscal year. Special Ed Circuit Breaker, I know that was brought up earlier, and we um, did increase that to a 72.5% reimbursement rate, which is um, uh, an increase of 20, $25 million over the, the previous fiscal year. McKinney Vento, I know it's always a favorite. Um, we did <laughs> increase that by $9 million, which was a 12% increase over the prior fiscal year. And our favorite regional school transportation um, was funded at 68.9, and I believe we, uh, by the math, we got up to 75%, so very close, we're at 75% uh, reimbursement rate. And just as a point of sort of, I guess, um, editorial commentary, I think the pushback that I hear from folks up at the state level in terms of the regional school transportation is, they don't want to get to 100% because they feel that if they do that, the towns don't have skin in the game, so to speak, and won't have that incentive to find efficiencies. And so I think we have to find kind of a way around that. And um, Auditor Bump had come up with a report last term, and she had some good ideas about um, coming up with stipends to encourage uh, districts to find efficiencies so there was still um, sort of skin in the game for the school districts. Um, we did make some sort of tentative steps towards that during the past, past uh, session and established a regional school transportation um, study commission to look at some of those equity issues. Um, also, they were tasked with coming up with some alternatives. I know one of the things that was talked about was using um, 
having more integration with regional, excuse me, regional um, transit authorities, so like GATRA, to, um, to provide some of those services. So that's something that is actively being looked at, and I know, you know, I hear it from you guys every time I come, and uh, I appreciate it, and don't get me wrong. Um, and, you know, I know other legislators do as well, and it's something we're definitely looking at hard. I just, you know, I don't want to make promises, but I know that's something that people are concerned about. Um, and um, then the last bit was just, I, you know, there's a lot of talk about the uh, Foundation Budget Review Commission that we did a couple of years ago and some changes that they recommended. Um, specifically, they looked at and said that we were really falling short in terms of uh, special ed, English as a second language, and also insurance costs, um, OPEB liability, OPEB costs, other post-employment benefit costs. And um, so those are sort of identified as some of the key areas where we need to, to uh, improve and to tweak our foundation budget. The caution I would just say in general, but any time we talk about changing the foundation budget, if we're not, if we're just divvying up the same pie in a different way, that's not always going to be to our benefit. Mm -hmm. And you know, hopefully it will be, and we're going to advocate like heck to, so that it is. But we have to increase the size of that pie. That's the only way we're really going to get more money uh, in a substantial way back to our school districts. Because unfortunately, and, and I don't want to place put urban, suburban uh, folks, pit, each, pit folks against each other because we all have our, our, our needs. But you know, we're not going to win that, that fight against the urban school districts. They're always going to get uh, a bigger share of the pie. So we have to find ways to make the pie bigger overall. Uh, one, uh, one note of good news that I would like to, to make sure folks are aware of, in the current fiscal year, FY19, we actually got 30% of the way towards the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations through our, you know, sort of not piecemeal approach, but through our, our small bore, you know, changes, even without the millionaire tax or other big major new sources of revenue. So we made some significant progress. We made 30% of the way. That's, that's real progress. Um, you know, hopefully we will make more progress this fiscal year. It's too soon to know. Um, but I think that's important to note. I, I am very sure that the issue of um, school formulas will come back up again this year. It was one of the big things that was debated <coughs> in the last session, and both branches passed different bills, and they weren't able to iron out the differences before the clock kind of ran out. So I know that that will be a major focus, and I expect that there will be some sort of bill passed. Um, I still am just naturally cautious about whether that's going to be a big benefit to us or not. So um, though I think those are sort of all the big things I wanted to hit on. Happy to take questions uh, given all that and just with the understanding that we're in the first inning of the game. But <laughs> Great. Right. How did I know? <laughs> I, I actually have a note here. Red may bring up. Be prepared to. <laughs> well, I will say that uh, everyone in your office is always very helpful uh, and it's very appreciated. Uh, as far as that goes. I just got to say it disturbs me to know that we increased Chapter 70 funding overall in the state by 3.4 percent, but yet our increase was half a percent. Uh, that's scary, and it, it really strangles us. Uh, the towns, you know, I mean, I said it before, I, I, and I know you understand the plight. Yep. Uh, it, it, you know, the good news is we now have more representatives uh, that are hopping onto our cause, so to speak, grouping uh, for regional school districts that are uh, hearing us a little bit. Because the only real ways we're going to see anything <coughs> for us is going to be in regional transportation. <coughs> it's going to be in circuit breaker. Uh, those are going to be the real areas to get things fully funded. We've already, as a district here, uh, we have skin in the game, okay? We've changed our starting times on our buses. You know, we've grouped with the local uh, town, you know, to try and get a better contract. Uh, one of the items that was brought up, and I know Desi's well aware of it, the lack of competition when you go out to bid on a busing contract. Yeah. It, you know, it's really, really a big problem. I think that's one of the reasons why they wanted to try to bring in you know, the gatras of the world, the regional transit authorities to try to fill that void a little bit. But you know, I mean, so right. you, we've got to try and be imaginative and whatnot, but we've done everything we can to be imaginative, but it's, 
you know, I just want you to be thousand dollars a year. I hear when I bring when I make my case to the mm -hmm. folks, that's the feedback I get. Well, you know, so just so you're aware, that's yeah. all. And, I, and I, I totally agree. And to your point, Fred, and, and I mean to cut you off. Feel free to jump back in if you have more to say. But you know, the, the Chapter yeah. 70 formula itself. You know, we know because our school enrollment is flat, or in some cases declining, and that is the key reason why we're not seeing the increases more than the minimum. Um, and that's why every year we prioritize the minimum per pupil expenditure, you know, which was, um, you know, governor proposed it at 20, we got it to 20 to 30, one year it was 50, you know, it's, it's annual battle every year to get it back up. And, uh, you know, I have a bill actually that set at the floor at 50, but um, that is, that is the battle. And that is the, the only area really in terms of the foundation budget where we're going to mm -hmm. see a significant increase because of the fact that our, our, our enrollment is flat. We have, you know, in some case, I don't know what the enrollment is. You know, All right, but my is, argument to that is, if it costs the state $5,000 per pupil under Chapter 70 funding, just as a number, okay? If it's $5,000 a pupil and you're going to give <clears> us $50, <throat> it doesn't touch the increase of what it costs to educate that child. And it doesn't touch what our costs are, you know, just to give level services. That's, you know, the $50 is an arbitrary, arbitrary number. But if we tie it to a percentage of what the increased costs are, you know, then we're looking at substantially more money. Right. Okay. You, you could definitely do that if you had a bigger pie. But unless you're making the pie bigger, you're, what you're talking about. Well, it's still proportional per come? pupil. But it's, where's it going to come from? Well, <laughs> you, you, know, you got gambling money? <laughs> no. Well, we do have. I, uh, I, and in, in your estimates, that was the other question. Does that take into consider into consideration casino funds and marijuana funds? So yes. Uh, in fact, I glossed over that. I, I'm sorry, I skipped over that. It does include uh, some gaming funds. It includes uh, marijuana revenues, and with the caveat that they're very early on. Um, I think I might have mentioned in there. If not, I have the uh, full report here. Um, we only have a short amount of data in terms of the, the marijuana. So figuring out you know, what the sustainable revenue is going to be and where that gets eaten into somewhere else because maybe our excise tax from alcohol will go down. or you know, we, don't, we just don't know. Um, once we have a full year of data, we'll be able to know. But we, you know, we have made um, progress finding other revenue sources, you know, getting a little creative. We, we're going to have, um, there's probably going to be an Airbnb type tax that, that goes into effect. Um, um, so that will bring in some revenue and that will actually have, probably have a local component to it. So that is something I don't, a lot of hotels, and, but you know, there are, you could rent out your, your luxurious uh, mansion and spread and, and uh, you know, make some money and the town would get money to boot. So, super. <laughs> Anyone else? Jeff? I just wanted to publicly thank Josh for earmarking the $35,000 oh, yeah. for, for technology yeah. and Chromebooks for us. I had to do that. So we received 147 Chromebooks because of that earmark. Oh, there is. That oh, will right. go to elementary, elementary schools. And it right. costs about $238 a Chromebook. Yeah. So thank cool. you so much for that work. And that was a surprise. So we very much appreciate like good that. surprises, right? Yeah, right. Don't want so not, it's not all bad. <laughs> so we appreciate you working for us. I, I thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Josh. Well, appreciate it. Uh, 31 Forest Street. Just a, a comment on the state aid. Um, <clears throat> what I've been, I've been trying to pay attention the last couple of years, especially to how <coughs> state aid affects not only the school budget, but the, but the town budget. And um, for me, it, it seems to be that if you look at how much state aid we get compared to how much our neighboring towns get, we get way more. Not like $100,000 more, but millions more dollars in state aid really significantly you know like it's hard to it's hard for me to state how how much more money we get than they get it, and i and maybe getting some feedback from josh Cut, cutler would be helpful but i think we need to hear a bit of truth i think as we as we look forward to create a sustainable budget moving forward the next five years i don't think we can realistic realistically ask the state for more money if you ask them to revisit the foundation formula I think what you'll find is we get too much and not by a small amount. Again, I can't, I can't overstate that. It's like 63% of our foundation budget is covered by the state. Towns around us, it's as low as like 39%. You know, it's, it's not even close. So as we step forward and as we're talking to people about not just a Band-Aid or 
you know, something small to help us just get through this year. We need to really look at a sustainable budget. And I, I think the bit of truth is the state's not going to come in to help. We just, we already received too much state aid. So it's got to come from somewhere else because that's, I don't think it's a realistic option, honestly. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope he can stand up and say, you know, we've, we redid the formula and despite those numbers, you know, Whitman deserves more money. But I think we get really um, the lion's share of, of uh, state aid. So. But don't, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Boyce. But don't we, though, Sean, have this word out there, like I was mentioning, and wasn't sure if it was the right time or not, a target share where money grows based on that? I mean... I, I, I know what you're talking about, and... Um, it's not... We're, we're, we don't... We're not, definitely not apples to apples with other... with East Bridgewater, Abington, so on, but we're apples to apples with other... Um, regional districts. Maybe we always like to towards the top with but... Dudley Charlton, and you know it was always. And we just slowly have lost that momentum there. Yeah, I I don't see that. I, I hope and maybe we could put out a report to see. But based on the numbers that I'm running, I think we we really receive tons of money. And yeah, but what do you think the target share does for us? Add kindergarten. But with that, we talked about, I mean, we were talking about that at, at great lengths last year. Uh, honestly, I was looking at, I've trip. been looking at the last two budget presentations um, the last couple weeks, and there was one line, actually, and I remember reading it. It said um, the state wants us to be at 59% uh, or something, and we're at like 63%. And I was thinking, that's not so bad. It's like 4% off. But they changed it. I was reading it wrong. Right now, the state picks up 63%. They want us, the local community, to pick up 59%. Right now, we're only picking up like 40%. You know, so it's, it's like a big, big gap. Um, I just don't, I think the problem is they've given us so much state aid over a period of time and we've allowed our taxes to stay low and to, to fund some other programs appropriately. And now they're pulling back just a little bit. That's why the held harmless clause. You know, so we get the held harmless, not going to take away, maybe, but they're not going to give us more. You know, and, and I think that's the bit of truth. And moving forward in the next five years, having that projection, it's, uh, it only gets bigger and bigger. So whatever we do, I think, in the coming months, it has to be a sustainable budget over the next five years and how we can close that gap. Otherwise, small increase in funds might put a band-aid on something this year and then we'll be right back to where we were and that's a major part of the the problem that seems so difficult to solve right now well why just five years oh why not 10 why yeah, not 20. Sure. We're, we're just move in the future 50. yeah i know but i mean you, 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 that's what it is it no i mean the point is down to if it. if uh the budget's growing at three percent or so but you're we're only getting from the state of the 24 or 25 million it's only going up, not even one percent. And as aggressive and as we were to ask the town for more, we ran the tank dry quite a few times. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could see myself asking for those huge, yeah, I, huge I'm numbers. I'm just talking math. It just the math doesn't. Okay. Add up. Well, I'm, I'm, same thing. But I don't. I, I can't. I just can't imagine it. There's got to be something that we signed a contract with the state. Basically, we married them. Yeah, we're regional. And you said these things. Fred? And the town's made decisions, okay? And I'm not going to get into a debate about one department, another department, et cetera. That's not what we're here for, okay? We're here to talk about a school budget. And a school budget that's been predicated upon receiving Chapter 70 funding that has been very generous over the years. Right about 2008, they started cutting us back. Okay, there were years we received a $2 million increase in Chapter 70 funding. And the reason we received that is because we did what the state asked us to do when we regionalized. Okay, we combined our expenses and we were told, you do this, we take care of you. Okay, <clears throat> and now they've gone back on their word. Not Josh himself, because Josh has always been an advocate for us. But now the state has stopped. 
And the only way the state can fix it, in my mind, bless, bless you. you, in my mind, doing simple math, is for them to give us a reasonable increase percentage-wise. Tie it into our per pupil, you know, you can wait it out exactly. You're saying, well, you don't think that it's fair and you don't think that we're gonna see it. They're like the crack dealer on the corner, okay? They called us up, they got us in, they hooked us in, and we drank the Kool-Aid with them. Okay, now they're taking it away. Well, I don't think that they have the right to take it away. I think that we need to fight for every penny that we can. Now, realistically, at the end of the day, it may be scraps that we end up with. Okay, it may be 100,000 in regional transportation. That's $100,000, that's what we were able to accomplish last year. Okay, go at it systematically, bit by bit, and fight for every penny. And yes, we've got to work with the towns and we've got a big problem this year. And it's not just this year, it's next year, et cetera. And our townspeople are going to have to end up deciding what do they want our towns to look like? Yeah. Okay, so that's going to that. be the end result. I, but I, as far as the state's culpability, they are absolutely positively responsible, yeah. in my mind. I just keep trying to put myself, uh, I want to gain a better perspective. And I think, what if I was from East Bridgewater? And East Bridgewater has some significant problems yeah, right now. If they're only receiving, say, nine or $10 million in state aid, and we're receiving in Whitman like over $14 million, how is that? How is this, like, Why don't they this call us up and ask us to regionalize? No, I, I just that would be a solution for them, wouldn't it? We got the money because we regionalized, and now they took it away. Right. What East Bridgewater does, that's their problem. Yeah. We get screwed by the state by taking money out. When we regionalized, they was going to pay for stuff. We live fat and fat and on the hog for all those years. I don't. I'm I'm with you. I hope they give yeah, us but more I mean, money. I just us think to the other, truth is we're compare not. Compare us to other cities and towns in the area. It doesn't compare, to Sean. You know, we made a contract with the state. They took it back. I mean, yeah, we were getting a lot of money, but we were supposed to be getting that money. Period. I mean, okay. I've, it's getting we've, heard, we've heard no. both. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We have Donovan, 81, Old Mansion Lane. Um, I wanted to go back to what you were saying about communicating with parents and apps and stuff that you've been using. I absolutely appreciate all the posts that you've made about visiting teachers, and I think you're preaching to the choir here. We all know you're uh, approachable and available to <laughs> us. Um, I would love everyone else in town to know that and um, reading the budget that you presented here again I feel like it's preaching to the choir I can only hope that the naysayers in town who are watching tonight or that they're gonna watch this at some point but I have to assume that they're not watching when you share all this information so I hate to ask you to do more but I would love <laughs> to have that shared sure. as publicly as possible every every meeting everywhere possible so that when you guys are fighting like crazy with the state. We need you to do that. And then when us parents go out and fight like crazy in town and try to talk to people and explain what's going on, I don't have to hear again that they don't tell us what the numbers are and they don't share the numbers. And um, now it's turning to even if they share the numbers, the school committee is untrustworthy. And it makes me furious to hear that. So I'd love to not have to, def I guess, defend you guys in that sense if all that's out there as publicly as possible because it won't be just the state doing giving us the money and it won't be just the town we definitely need both sides and you guys please keep doing what you're doing and we'll do what we can in town but i think that would help us help you if that makes first sense step. it's yeah. december it's our first step yeah tell me the hot spots in town we can go you know we can travel in roadshow yeah what what i will say is when we do go out and do the traveling roadshow if parents can bring a couple people so we're not yep. preaching to the choir. I can yep. use social media as much as we can to publicize. We can do YouTube videos. We yeah. can do all kinds of little things because that is this, is, this is who we are, this is us. And we're in it together to do different Absolutely. things. As I said about the Chiefs, advocating for their people and their departments, 100% agree. Yep. I've got to do the same. I we'll think it, it can all there. be a great team and that would just be my two cents that we can all help each other, help each other, you know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else before we move on with the budget? Uh, I'd, I'd just like to finish on, on tailing in with her statement. Ladies and gentlemen, you care about education, you wanna see education continue, 
with a level service budget or above, please come to school committee meetings. Please look at what's on the town agendas, come in and help be part of the solution to solving these problems. Be part of the solution with the selectmen who work hard and with the finance committees who work hard and with the other department heads that work hard. Be part of that solution and come and help. Let's work together. That's why we asked everybody to come and see if we can put our heads together and get it going so we understand where we're going to be at and where we need to go to. Because as you can see, the funding is a, is a problem. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Authorization to sign, Jeff. Um, I have a document and we vote this every year. And thank you everyone for coming. We vote this every year. We, Jeff is obviously a new superintendent. At the December 12th meeting, 2018, we voted to authorize Jeff Simonak, superintendent of schools, to make and execute and approve contracts on behalf of the Whitman Hanson Regional School District. I would entertain a motion to accept so this moved. document as written. Second. <laughs> Do I have a motion and a second? Yes. Any discussion? It's a, all those it's, in favor? Uh -huh. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to sign and give it back to Michelle. No. Thank you. Yeah. What, Fred? It's for the period as the yeah. acting superintendent. No, yeah, I we we can do it yearly. <clears throat> okay, school committee news and updates. I believe that you've heard. Uh, I told you the dates to remember. Mm -hmm. Charting mm -hmm. the course. Sir? Charting the course is. We are lucky enough to have charting the course here for. You folks for school committee, MASC will be here on February 2nd. It's a Saturday, 9 a.m. I'd encourage everyone to come. Mr. Scriven will be there as a new school committee member, but it's going over February 2nd. February 2nd. Um, right, the week after the polar plunge. <laughs> thought out, Mr. Still pneumonia. <laughs> thought out, man. Yes, very um, thought. <laughs> but I'd encourage you guys to come. Uh, I think it's a good, I've gone through a, a little bit of it through my superintendent induction program. I'm going to try to make it as well. Just giving us a way, an avenue, and learning different ways of what school committees should be advocating for, their rules and responsibilities around that. It'll be new for me as well. So February 2nd, 9 a.m., up in the, in the in our new central office uh, room, meeting room. Or it might be in the or library. Here. Or in the library, <laughs> depending on. Because this is folks from all over the area that will yeah, be there. Yeah. I think we have Michelle to thank for that, too. She yeah. kind of put the yeah. arm on. Uh, Mr. Hardy. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Because usually, if you do charting the course, it's out in the western part of the state. Well, and, or something like that. <laughs> so, Mr. Scriven, you got it a little easier. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. I was that wasn't bad. Any other questions? Uh, oh, warrants. I'll, I'll do that one. The team of Jeff and, and George have come up to try to simplify the warrant. Sometimes there's confusion when we're signing warrants, whether it's the warrant committee or any one of the 10 members of the school committee. So the warrants are going to be ready. You will receive an email. They will be up in the office. They will be available to be signed when Christine is there. So if anyone has any questions on any of the items, you won't be wasting your time. You'll be able to go up and say, what about this? What about that? What about these? What about those? They'll all be there to make sure that that's all available to you. So there's no confusion, and hopefully we can move this warrant process on. If anybody's confused with it, it'll be someone there to ask. Because at other times we've had warrants, and I think tonight I saw somebody, some of you guys signing warrants. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to get it. They're going to try to get it, and Christine, so it's all right in one place, right in one time. They're all available. So if there's any questions, there's no problem. Any questions? Okay. New business. We don't have any gifts. <laughs> we don't have any surplus. We don't have any field trips. Oh, wow. Okay. That's almost a miracle. Can you make one? Warrant <laughs> subcommittee. I'd entertain a motion to accept the minutes of uh, November 20th. So move. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. I'd entertain a motion to accept, <coughs> excuse me, the minutes of December 6, 2018. So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Yeah, thank you. Policy One sub. Abstention. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm abstaining. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was unanimous. Fred's abstaining. 
on the December 6th one? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Policy subcommittee. I don't believe there's been any meeting no. or any changes. No. Facilities and capital improvements. Haven't met. Matt, you gave a report last, last time. Last, last meeting we did. Legislative update. I think we heard it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Pilgrim area. Dipno Tom has officially started with us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great heaven of energy. Um, our meetings are generally the first Thursday at 6 o'clock at the Hatch Building in Pembroke. Pub public is welcome to those as well. Um, but we're off to a good start so far for this year. Um, it's tuition based and it's a whole different thing than what you see us do here, either monthly or actually year round. Thanks. But um, it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful school and it's a great collaborative. Uh, the number of schools they have is, I think, four or five independent academies, Seaside, and I'm going to miss a few names, Paces, but uh, Pilgrim area. And I know I mentioned earlier Jeff representing the North River. Um, that's just a wonderful group, too. Uh, you know, hats off to them. Sorry the tuitions went up uh, for us. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, we, you know what? We just, it's just that <clears throat> same thing everyone feels is the sustainability and being able to move forward. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Mr. Did, Boyce? Did we get our check, Christine, yet? We're supposed to get like that. I talked about it two months ago. We were getting money back from Plymouth Area Collaborative. Oh, we did. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's awesome. That was, a, that was something we hadn't done in a few years, and um, so we gave money back. We had it. You know, we went over our excesses mm -hmm. and so forth, and we found that I think it was a distribution. I mean, I'm not even recalling the, the percentage, but out of the eight towns, seven of them received money back. So that, that's really nice. That's good. Thank Any you. questions for Mr. Boyce? Is there any chance you can get them to do the polar plunge with you? <laughs> I probably could. I'm. I'll bring as many people as you want. You want me to start asking around the JFK? Yeah. <laughs> How about the Friday volunteer at the other end of the desk? Too old. <laughs> 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 okay. Certainly. Negotiation subcommittee. We have reached a tentative <clears throat> agreement with Unit B. It just needs to be ratified, which I think is going to happen fairly soon, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, it, it anticipated for the uh, January, I believe it's the 16th. 16th. Yes, yeah. Okay. All right, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Right above. Thank Love you all. Oh my God.